Alan Kohler here, and I'm talking to Bill Mitchell, who is a professor in economics at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales. And he is one of the founders, possibly the founder, of modern monetary theory. And he says that he gave it its name, modern monetary theory, and um, is a exponent of it. And he uh, responded to a column that I wrote in The Australian uh, last Monday in which I said that modern monetary theory's time has come, but Bill says that uh, all very nice, but I misunderstood it. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get him on the blower and get him to explain it, which he has done at some length. It's a very long interview. Sorry about that, but it's really worthwhile. Uh, it's one of the more interesting interviews I've ever done, I must say, and um, well worth uh, listening to. I'll summarise it in the weekend briefing so that if you don't have the time to read the whole thing or listen to the whole thing, that's fair enough. I will provide a summary for the weekend briefing, but really I'd urge you to either read or listen to the whole thing. It's about three quarters of an hour. Uh, very, very interesting. So here's Bill Mitchell, Professor of Economics at the University of Newcastle. Well, Bill, um, I wrote a piece for The Australian uh, this week saying that monetary, modern monetary theory's time has come, uh, and you immediately put up a post saying that I didn't know what I was talking about or words to that effect and that uh, I misunderstood MMT. Now, um, you, I think, describe yourself as one of the founders of MMT with Warren Mos Moslick, and perhaps in order to uh, set me straight and to, set, and to help our readers understand MMT, take us back to when you kind of uh, thought of it and what were the circumstances, and, and what what was the what was the thing that led to it at the, in your thinking and Warren's perhaps? Yeah, well, I mean, um, Warren and I come from totally different backgrounds. Of course, I, I come I come through an academic background, so I sort of work things out by looking at data and you know studying history and things like that. And Warren's background was. Uh, in Wall Street, basically, in America. He was a banker and uh, he started the uh, the trading in the initial Chicago Futures Exchange. And so he, he had a sort of hands-on, non-academic uh, background. And uh, so we worked we worked out things from a totally different background. I, my, I started working, working it out, what's now called modern monetary theory. I started my part of it in, in, when I was a, a student at Melbourne University in uh, the late 1970s. And it was at the time, if you recall, the Razor Gang was, uh, Phil Lynch's Razor Gang was uh, cutting expenditure thinking because after the OPEC oil crisis, we had inflation and they thought the solution was to cut spending and uh, solve inflation. That way, unemployment for the first time had really gone up. And I was doing agricultural economics and... Uh, uh, we were studying the wool price stabilisation scheme. And so I understood from that that if you had a buffer stock of wool, you could basically uh, create full employment of wool and regulate the price. And uh, so I sort of started thinking along those lines. And then when the Japanese property market, cra commercial property market crashed in the early 90s, uh, I wondered how... Japan had uh, been able to escape with one negative quarter of GDP uh, as a result of the biggest commercial property crash in history. And uh, so I started to look into Japan and how it, its monetary system, how its central bank operated, how the fiscal policy interacted with uh, uh, monetary policy, uh, how bond markets started to work and those things. Now, Warren had worked out very detailed understanding of how banks work and how the banks interact with the central bank and and how how bond markets work because he was a fixed income trader so his basic day to day life was uh, doing deals uh, on speculative uh, uh, expectations on bond market movements and he'd worked out that uh, he did a very big trade in the Italian lira bond at the time when every, in the early 90s when everybody was predicting it would crash. This was during the 91 recession when everybody was predicting that yields would rise and bond prices would fall. And he obviously uh, worked out that uh, uh, 
the the Bank of Italy controlled basically controlled all yields if it wanted to, and that there would be uh, no real possibility of uh, the yields rising. Uh, the, the government really was the issue of the currency couldn't run out of money, and so the bond markets were really not not in charge. It was the government in charge which allowed the bond market some space to operate. This is when uh, it, this is this is when Italy had the lira. It wasn't part of the euro, right? Oh yeah, it was pre. It was early nineties. We it was during the big ninety one recession, and uh, uh, so this was when when Italy it was the same as Australia it had its own currency, whereas now, of course, it uses a foreign currency, the euro. So Warren had worked out those things, and we came together in about ninety four, ninety late ninety four through a very early internet discussion list. And we realised that we were sort of on the same page, coming from different directions, and uh, we started this project, which is called, which later I, I called Modern Monetary Theory. But uh, you, you, gave uh, it the, you, you, got, you gave it the name, did you, Bill? I did, yeah. I, I, I gave it the name during the global financial crisis because up until then we were wondering what, what you know, we, we were had a loose-knit project. We were working together. Warren was starting to use his financial clout to fund uh, young researchers in America and try to build up uh, capacity in America. And uh, so more and more young academics came into the project. Um, uh, but up until... up and For a long time, we had... We just mucked around in the normal academic way. We went to conferences and published papers and then in 2004 I, I, I went to a seminar and uh, uh, on IT and they were saying oh there's this new technology called blogs this was the sort of beginnings of social media and so I figured well look uh, no one in the academic profession is listening to us because you know the economics profession is a really closed shop and uh, uh, it's heavily, heavily conditioned by what I call, what we call groupthink and uh, denial. And so I started a blog and uh, that really started to um, pro- proliferate the ideas out in. And I, I, I'd have to say that, um, uh, and you probably felt a bit of this the other day on social media, but I, uh, MMT, as it's now called, is probably the first economic paradigm that 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 has grown through social media and uh from then i mean uh, then then it just uh, has uh, grown in uh, interest before uh, i think before uh, you and warren got together and started really kind of focusing on this you were all called post keynesians weren't you uh i never felt comfortable with post keynesian but yeah i mean heterodox progressive post keynesians i mean uh, th- there's a there's a whole school of of academics, whole group of academics who identify themselves as post Keynesians, and these are, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's a broad church, but essentially it's about taking the insights of John Maynard Keynes and uh, applying them to modern institutional structures, because Keynes was, of course, you know, a very closed economy type fixed exchange rate system and uh, uh, we now live in a very open open economies with global capital and floating exchange rates. So, uh, yeah, we were sort of broadly within that camp. I never felt comfortable with that because I'd sort of come out of a, a more classical tradition with Marx and uh, Kaleski and uh, these characters and... Uh, um, Whereas, you know, uh, my other colleagues in MMT have very firmly come out of the Keynesian tradition. I mean, you said in your blog in your blog post replying to my column that MMT is neither right-wing or left-wing, but it is progressive, isn't it? I mean, uh, and perhaps in answering that, you could ex- start to explain what it is because you said in there that it isn't a policy or a fiscal policy. It's a way of thinking about uh, uh, it's a way of thinking about things. It's it's really a lens. You put it as a lens through which the you, l- that allows you to see the the true workings of the monetary system. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is progressive, isn't it? Well, it can be. It it, it it it's it's 
the 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 reason I, I, I liked your article, but the the reason I I said that you'd misunderstood MMT was because you were saying it that it's now MMT's time, <laughs> and uh, implying that we were going to move to MMT, and uh, that's a that's a common misconception on both the people that attack us and the people who who like us. And uh, the point I make always is that, you know, in just the same way as that I wear glasses so I can see better as I get older, MMT is like a lens, as you say. It's a way of, it's a framework for giving, getting a better understanding of the institutional realities of our monetary system, our, our uh, banking, central banking, fiscal system, and the opportunities that it, that, that uh, the, the, the capacities of the currency issuer, the, the, the government, uh, have. And, and, and in that sense, it's neither right wing nor left wing. Now, to, to operationalise that understanding uh, that, for example, that the government has no financial constraints on its spending, uh, to operationalise that into policy, you have to uh, add, add a value system so when you say it's progressive, I'm I'm a, I'm what is popularly called a progressive person, and I suspect you are. But that just means that uh, uh, I have a particular set of values about how I want the government to operate. Whereas you could imagine a person who was extremely free market oriented uh, and believed all that stuff, but who's who had the same understanding of the monetary system as I that as a, that I have as an MMT person, and they would have a completely different policy set to me, which I would call a right wing policy set. But we share the same understanding. Uh, I think what the the point is that what MMT understanding exposes are these sort of arguments that oh well we can't do anything about unemployment because we can't afford to do that. We don't have enough money. Politicians are always saying we don't have enough money. Well, they've got as much money as they want. But so therefore, when they say that, they're making a political value statement rather than a, a factual statement about their capacities as the currency issuer. I think that's the point. So, so you're saying that a sovereign country that issues its own currency has no financial constraints on what it spends. The only constraints are on the capacity of the economy to produce them produce whatever it is they buy. That, that's 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 a core thing about MMT. That the, the government's got infinite capacity because when you think about it, that uh, spending's happening every hour of every day. And how does it happen? It happens by someone in Department of Finance instructing someone in the central bank to type some numbers into some accounts. And that's the spending's going on like that all the time. And they, you know, they could add. At the moment, we're adding a lot of zeros to how much is being spent, and uh, nobody's nobody doubts that they can do that. The the, uh, the, the constraint, given given that uh, we want to avoid accelerating inflation, the constraint is the real resources that are available. And the important so so if if nominal spending uh, outpaces the capacity of the economy to produce real goods and services that we buy, then we put price pressures into the economy. That becomes the constraint. And if the government wants to expand beyond, say, if we've got a fully employed economy, and the and the government has a political mandate to increase the size of the public sector, you know, for, for a Green New Deal or whatever you want to call it, for example, then it has to work out how to how to free up resources that it can then buy without causing inflation. And uh, but that's the constraint. Uh, always that's the constraint. Never how much money the government's got. It's got as much as it ever wants. So so Milton Friedman said that inflation is always and everywhere. A monetary phenomenon a, 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 is is one of the kind of core ideas of MMT that he was wrong. Well, it's, it's sort of a it's a it's a diff, it's a parallel way of thinking. Uh, you know, he he said that it was always to do with the monetary supply uh, 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 
accelerating and that that you know too much too much money chasing too few goods now if you want to think about it like that then there's uh it's really too much spending chasing too few goods because what we've seen in in since the global financial crisis but in the 1990s in Japan as they were fighting their uh problems we've seen money supply expand dramatically and uh, with no inflation and uh we've seen bank reserves you know i mean how what size are bank reserves now around the world with and what size are uh, are the asset side of the central bank's balance sheets in you know in some countries Japan Britain European Central Bank Federal Reserve the, and 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 soon the Reserve Bank of Australia have got extremely uh, you know huge expansion of their their balance sheet assets in the form of government bonds and and increasingly corporate bonds and that expands reserves in the banking system or and expands the money supply, no inflation. So he must have been wrong. There must be another reason why why you get inflation. So uh, um, uh, are you saying that uh, – so so is, is it an oversimplification to think of it as, as being the central banks, instead of buying bonds, creating money as they do with quantitative easing, creating money – to buy bonds from banks to inject cash into the financial system, to instead of doing that, to buy bonds directly from the government uh, and therefore monetise uh, fiscal spending by the governments directly. Is that is that an oversimplification that, that really that's what MMT implies, as you put it, to operationalise the idea? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't, a lot of people misunderstand quantitative easing. And it, when when most people ignored Japan in the nineties, but they became as familiar with quantitative easing in the during the global financial crisis when Bank of England and Federal Reserve and then later the European Central Bank was engaging in very large exercises which we call QE, and they thought that oh well QE was about uh, giving the banks extra money to lend. And that would stimulate lending and would solve the, you know, uh, uh, allow for biz- uh, gross capital formation, business investment to grow, blah, and whatever. The problem is that that's a total misconception that uh, quantitative easing doesn't work like that because banks actually, all quantitative easing does is swap assets with the banks. So it gives them bank reserves. Central bank just types in some numbers to reserves and they then take over some. Uh, government or corporate off the the banking sector. Now, now banks don't never lend out reserves. That's a that's a misconception. Reserves are there just for the payment system to allow the daily clearing of checks, as we say. And banks might lend on the interbank market, the overnight market, the reserves to if some banks short of reserves on any particular day. And, and other banks got excess reserves, but they don't lend them out to, to, to clients. That's a misconception. The way QE works is that it, by intervening in the secondary bond market, say, the government bond markets, it drives up demand, drives down yields. So the central bank buying up the bonds in the secondary bond market forces up the price, drives down yields on all of the assets within that maturity range, say 10 years or five years or whatever it is that the central bank's doing, and as a consequence, lowers all inter- other interest rates in, in in that maturity, including you know all of the sort of corporate and uh, lending rates to, to corporations. And so the only way QE could be stimulative if, in that sense is if it, by lowering interest rates at the investment range where uh, corporations borrow to buy uh, capital and uh, the problem is that in a recession and certainly now there's not going to be too much borrowing uh, and so QE is quite ineffective in that sense uh, and so the question then is uh, do we really want the Reserve Bank to engage in QE? I don't want it to engage in QE. I want it to monetise government spending. And uh, as you say, the central bank uh, is basically part of the government sector. Uh, 
the it interacts every day with the treasury in, uh, to uh, um, coordinate uh, treasury spending and taxation injections and drains from the economy and uh, its own uh, liquidity management processes, which are uh, essential to maintaining its policy rate, which is currently 0.25. And so it's not a, it's, it, it doesn't make much difference if the government stops issuing bonds altogether to the, to the private bond market and, uh, and merely just uh, continues to mark up bank accounts as they do on a daily basis. And if you want to have an accounting offset, the central bank can just have a whole lot of government bonds. It's, it's pretty irrelevant, really, the, the accounting structures that they do. The essential point is that the, the bond issuance doesn't reduce the inflation risk anyway. So, so, so uh, just looking at the, the situation we now find ourselves, the, the government, the Australian government has been announcing fiscal stimulus, but they've been announcing amounts of it, you know, so this was started off at $17.6 billion, and now it's latest one is $66 billion in fiscal yeah. uh, stimulus or, you know, help for companies and so on. Um, and probably but they're not. What they're not doing is saying it's unlimited. They're not saying we are going to, un, you know, in an unlimited sense, help uh, pay for people's salaries and keep companies alive. And you're saying that that's a political decision because they don't want to. Uh, because for their from their point of view, all that stuff involves issuing bonds and uh, going in further into debt, which they don't want to do. But you're saying that that they could go unlimited. Um, well, with, the reserve, with the reserve bank, with the reserve bank monetising the spending. Well, at the moment, the, there's not going to be very many rural resource constraints. When you've got, what, what are we? I did an estimate yesterday. Some, you know, we could have two million people unemployed, and uh, they're rural resources. And uh, we're going to have lots of businesses with lots of inventory unsold, and uh, lots of factories with spare capacity, and. Uh, lots of importers with uh, lots of inventory. So you can hardly say, and I'm not saying you are saying it, but the government could hardly say that they're coming up against an inflation barrier. And in that contest, in that context, uh, you know, there's current stimulus ignoring the 40 billion that they've got in their sort of unspecified account that they approved at the last minute that they haven't announced that they'll spend yet. That's their little buffer. Their current stimulus is only 4.2% of GDP, which was almost exactly the same as the Rudd stimu- the two Rudd stimuluses in uh, 2008, early 2009. It's almost as if the Treasury's got a fixation on 4.2%. But that's not a very large stimulus when you think that, you know, Britain's going for about 15%. Uh, uh, Japan regularly goes above when it has a crisis, regularly goes above 10 or 11%. And my bet is if you've got a million and a half to two million people unemployed, then you're going to have to go closer to 10%. And if you think about it, that, um, you know, before the before this corona crisis, the, the pursuit of the surplus was already uh, straining demand in the economy. We've got a household debt of what, 180% of disposable income, corporate debt about two and a half times its finan- their financial assets. And you've, and you've got GDP growth before the crisis was already what about, you know, it well, depends how you calculate trend, but was already at least one and a half percent per annum below trend growth. And you had 13.9% labour underutilisation, either underemployed or unemployed. Well, in that context you're, context, you're already probably about, your deficit was probably already about 1.5% of GDP too small anyway. And so then you start a crisis where there was what looks like being a total meltdown and uh, what did Warren McKibben come up with, 8% of GDP collapse? That was his estimate. It could be bigger than that. It could be a bit smaller, but it'll be somewhere up there if, if they don't do much. And so you've got, Massive capacity for the government to spend at the moment, and uh, it doesn't have to worry about worry about uh, 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 inflation at all. And and eventually, it will have to worry about inflation again. And at that point, it, the deficit has to be smaller. 
But at the moment, it, it, uh, 4.2% is uh, is too small, and I think that they, you know, they will come to realise that. I think what they've done in the last two weeks is abandoned for the time being their mentality, their surplus obsession, because it, you know events have overtaken them, and uh, they will soon see that uh, the rest of the world is going 10 or 15 percent of GDP. They'll have to go bigger. But the um, uh, but they're still stuck. They have abandoned their surplus obsession, obviously. But they are still stuck in the mindset of thinking of deficit as debt. Are they not? Well, well, the institutional arrangements with the Australian Office of Financial Management mean that deficits uh, is, is debt. That's true. Uh, they haven't yet got to the point of saying, "Well, we won't issue debt. We'll just instruct the Reserve Bank to." credit the bank accounts for us and then conduct some appropriate accounting arrangements to record that. They haven't got to that stage yet and whether they do, is, a, is, is a, they probably won't get to that stage. I would recommend them to get to that stage. And even people like Adair Turner in Britain, who was you know the chair of the Financial Services Authority, the prudential regulator, he, he's been recommending that. So it's not just crazy people like me. But but, but, uh, it, but, it's, but no one's no one's got to that stage, have they? I mean, you say that the UK is at fifteen percent of um, GDP stimulus, and so are, so is Spain, and so is France, and I think Germany's there too. Um, uh, everyone's kind of at, at around fifteen percent of GDP is stimulus, but they're all going to be issuing debt to pay for that, aren't they? Yeah, but yeah, but what they're also doing, and this is this is where where QE does. Uh, Resonate because what they're also doing. I mean, the ECB, the European Central Bank, has announced unlimited bond buying. So it's even broken with all of their stuff about capital keys. You know, where they had to buy in proportion to the to the size of the economies uh, in Europe, and they couldn't buy any more of a particular government debt. They've just abandoned that. They've said they'll buy unlimited quantities of debt, and they're encouraging the European Commission to abandon the fiscal rules limiting the member states buying uh, running deficits. So what they're effectively saying is that they will go into the secondary bond markets on, on whenever they want and buy unlimited, unlimited uh, volumes of government uh, member state government debt. And Federal Reserve's done the same thing. Bank of England's done the same thing. If the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, starts to engage in QE, uh, they will be doing the same thing. So... Sure, we're still issuing debt in the primary market, and it won't take. Lo- yeah, so we're still issuing debt in the primary market to the to the the bond dealers, and that but the bond dealers know that the next day they can offload that to the central bank through a QE program. So in effect, and for and since the GFC, Japan, Bank of Japan, the ECB, Federal Reserve have been basically doing this. Mm. Uh, and in other words, what difference does it make that they buy in the secondary bond market the day after or the hour after it's issued in the primary market? No difference at all. They're basically they're, they're, they're basically directly funding governments, and they have been for ten years in several countries. So you've now got, you know, the ECB's got what forty percent of all government debt on its book. And the Bank of Japan's got forty-six percent of all the bank, all of the government of Japan's debt on its books, so they're already doing it, Alan. And uh, we 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 have no negative consequences as a result in terms of the standard things of inflation. Yields are negative in many cases. Uh, you know, on on long-term bonds, uh, twenty-year and ten-year bonds, yields yields are negative. So all of the sort of fear of central banks doing that. That come from the mainstream ec- economists haven't haven't proven to be correct, and that's why that's why the body of work that it's now called NMT is a much more accurate way of understanding the dynamics of the monetary system. So, so you're saying that Europe and England, and the US even and Japan are all practicing MMT now, effectively. Well, that's that's the point, and. Uh, uh, it's not a matter of practicing MMT. MMT is the the monetary system. It's a better way of understanding the monetary system. What these what 
Japan's my test case, and I have quite close relationships in Japan with you know, people in government. And uh, Japan has demonstrated for nearly 30 years now the principles of MMT uh, by running a, a monetary system where uh, you float your currency, you set your own interest rate, you issue your own currency. Um, the Bank of Japan has been demonstrating on a daily basis that... Uh, the main principles of mainstream economic theory that has dominated policy around the world are incorrect. But, uh, uh, bond, mar- bond markets c- can't set yields if the central bank doesn't let it. Uh, you know, you've got huge deficits in Japan. You've got the largest gross public debt ratio. You've got a uh, huge build-up of government debt on the central bank's assets in its balance sheet. It's been buying massive amounts of government debt in the secondary bond markets, in other words, really directly funding the deficits. And yet you've got zero interest rates, deflation and negative bond yields out out at long long maturities on the yield curve. Now if if I if I ask a ask a mainstream economic student to explain that, they wouldn't be a, possibly be able to explain that, whereas NMT can explain that. But what about the fact that the bonds are sitting on the central bank balance sheets and that they aren't simply, um, you know, doing a, uh, an, a, uh, an account or putting money into the government's account, as you suggest, uh, would be a better way to do it? Does that make a difference? I mean, what's going to happen to those bonds that are sitting on all of the central bank's balance sheets? Well, they mature. Uh, uh, in the same way that if they, if you and I held a government bond or a superannuation fund holds a government bond that matures and you get paid out the principal, and uh, it, whereas in in the in the case of us owning it or a super fund owning it, the 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 fine department, you know, the government pays the non-government holder the principal after paying the holder a stream of interest payments uh, which uh, over a period of time. Whereas in the case of uh, the bonds held by, say, the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance, just uh, uh, they mature, they get paid, and, uh, and, it's, and in that case it's sort of like the right pocket giving the left pocket some money. Uh, it's an internal government transfer. It's just an accounting transfer. And a lot of people are worried during the global financial crisis, particularly in Europe. People were worried that oh, if the if a government becomes like in, in the case of Greece or Italy, if they became insolvent in 2012, where it was really likely that they might, if the ECB didn't act, uh, what would happen if all of those bonds that the ECB was holding on its balance sheet, if the government went insolvent and couldn't repay the debt, well, nothing would happen. Uh, they would just get written off because unlike a corporation whose assets become valueless, uh, if the central all of those bonds on the central bank became valueless, well, then they'd just write them off. Uh, and, uh, you know, a central bank can operate with negative capital. A private company can't. And that's because it's part of government and not part of the profit-seeking corporate sector. So... It doesn't really matter what those what happens to those bonds. I mean, the way the orderly way that they're managed is they mature and they're they're paid. And uh, uh, you know, in the case of Germany, for example, the, the the Bundesbank has large holdings of German government bonds, and uh, it recently paid record amounts back into uh, back into the. German Ministry of Finance based upon profits that it made by holding those bonds. So right pocket giving the left pocket money. Um, the Reserve Bank's approach to quantitative easing is different to the other central banks in that it's targeting a particular interest rate on three-year bonds, 0.25%. Do, do, yep. you think that that, do you think that that effectively means that, it's, that, that the Reserve Bank's QE is unlimited? No, it won't be unlimited because uh, it'll be the, it'll be at the volume that's required to maintain liquidity consistent with a 0.25 interest rate. So um, 
Yeah, but I mean, but it's but it's basically going to buy whatever amount is required to achieve that, right? Oh yeah, but that 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 won't be unlimited because of volume restrictions. But uh, the the point is that yeah, they 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 will do you know the the parliament says those isn't it is do whatever it takes. They've set a yield target uh, that and uh, and that implies a a certain amount of liquidity management in the cash system that's going to be required to keep the 0.25 target as that's their monetary policy target. And uh, they'll do, they'll sell whatever, they'll buy whatever's needed to maintain that. And, uh, uh, and you and I both know that they can obviously do that. And uh, the bond markets are powerless in that case. They, they can't really uh, influence that, that choice at all. Do, do you think it possibly means that um, eventually the government stimulus uh, from 2020, from this year, will end up on the Reserve Bank's balance sheet? Uh, a significant portion of it will probably end up on the Reserve Bank balance sheet. Uh, you know, if you think about Japan, since since 2012, the Bank of Japan has bought virtually all of the Japanese government bonds that have been issued, not directly, but indirectly through secondary bond markets. Prior to that, less less than 100%, and so now they've got about 45, 46% of all government bonds on issue, outstanding government bonds. Uh, and similar stories around Europe, Britain, America. So I suspect that if the RBA does do this, which they're saying they're going to, then significant amounts of the debt that uh, is issued by the Australian financial management uh, to match the, not to fund, to match, this is the statement, but the bond issuing isn't funding the spending, it's just being, it's just matching the spending. And... Uh, uh, explain, that, exp- that, uh, ex- explain that difference. Why, um, why isn't the bond issuing funding the spending? Because the government doesn't need the, the the government doesn't need the bonds in order to spend. The government can just mark up accounts whenever it likes, and so the bond the bond issuing is is presumably for something else. Now, if you think back, we're both old enough to remember the uh, period uh, just after Costello and uh, was running surpluses. And by the end of the century, the uh, Australian government bond markets were becoming very thin, if you recall. And who complained about that? The Sydney Futures Exchange complained. And uh, if there was a uh, Commonwealth government debt management review, uh, 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 an investigation, I was I gave expert witness there, and uh, <laughs> it was decided that. Uh, um, even though the government was going to continue to run surpluses, so clearly in the mainstream logic did not need to issue bonds at all, that it was decided by the Costello uh, Treasury that they would continue to issue a certain volume of bonds each, each auction uh, as what I call corporate welfare to the uh, investment bankers. And that's what happened. And nobody really picked up on it, that the logic, the, the sort of dissonance in the logic of why would they continue to, if, if the bonds were funding the government spending, the government deficit, sorry, if the, if the bond issuance was funding the government deficit, why would they continue issuing bonds after they mature if they were running surpluses? And of course, the, the, bonds, the bonds being issued don't fund the spending at all. Uh, all they do is uh, drain reserves from the banking system. Now uh, that uh, and you know you think about open market operations. Well, then the central bank sells bonds to the private sector uh, to the banks because uh, they don't. Uh, you know, in an era before we had interest payments on excess reserves in the banking system. The only way in which the central bank could maintain managed liquidity if there was excess reserves was by draining them by bond issuing. That's an open market operation. So that's sort of what bonds do. They don't fund government spending. They 
they help but this is, central but, banks. But Bill, this is where I lose you a bit because I mean, when the when the government, when the Office of Financial Management sells bonds to the private sector, um, they raise money. Money comes in, right? Bonds go out, money comes in. Yeah, sure, but that money isn't necessary. That's just draining money from the non-government sector. That's just giving the non-government sector a bit of paper uh, and taking money out of, or taking funds out of the non-government sector hands. And in other words, just allowing the non-government sector to alter its portfolio of wealth. That's all that's happening. The government doesn't need that cash uh, in order to spend because it issues the currency. So once you under, once you once you realise that, then you you it's 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 obvious that the funding that they're taking out, yeah, they take funds. They could, they they mark down bank reserves, and the, and they you know within the if you want to think about the central bank accounting system, uh, all that really happens is that they transfer money from reserve accounts into government bond accounts that's all that's happening it's not giving them it's not giving the government any extra capacity to spend so you're saying really the decision to to sort of in a sense uh, replace their spending uh by draining money from the private sector is a political one well it, it it is these days uh but if you think back to before a very important thing happened in August 1971, and that was when the when President Nixon closed the 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 gold convertibility window, and the fixed exchange rate system basically ended. Now it didn't end exactly then, but that that was a point in history. Now, if you think back to the Bretton Woods system, the fixed exchange rate system, then uh, uh, domestic policy, monetary and fiscal policy, was tied to the was tied up in managing the exchange rate agreements. So the the central bank and the treasury had to work together to make sure that there was only as much liquidity in the in the cash system, including the foreign exchange markets, to allow the in our case the Australian dollar to meet the agreed parities with the, the fixed exchange rate system. Now in that context, bonds played a very important role because. Governments couldn't just be running deficits and pumping reserves into the system, into the monetary system, which would have uh, uh, created downward pressure on the exchange rate. So bonds were, were one of the tools which governments used to maintain its commitment uh, to the fixed exchange rate system. Now, once we floated our exchange rate, we floated in, what, the mid-80s or something? 83. Uh, yeah, 83, uh, Hawke, uh, once we floated the exchange rate, well, then that domestic policy was freed from any of that and um, uh, the bond issuance became uh, uh, unnecessary. Now, if you then think back to that period and um, there was a very important change in the way we structured our bond markets, we went from a tap system to an auction system and and there were if you go back and read the literature you've had uh statements from the incoming uh AOFM Australian Office of Financial Management officials saying we're going to continue issuing bonds because it gives it places a political discipline on governments now that's in the literature and they knew that uh the bonds were unnecessary to to to, for, for governments to run deficits, but that they were an incredibly powerful political device which governments became conditioned to obey because they, they, the opposition could say, look at the debt ratios. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, these are, these, these are political, this is a political choice. And, and moreover, I mentioned corporate welfare before, it's... Uh, the, the bond issuance, you know, the, the 2001 episode with the debt management review proved this beyond doubt that the that the investment community loves bond issuing, can't get enough of them, 
because they know they're risk-free and they allow them to benchmark all their other risk assets off their, their products off the risk-free um, Australian government bond. So, now, so another, sorry, go on, carry on. Yeah, well, there's another purpose of them too and uh, they're used uh, under the uh, Basel agreements as part of the sort of capital adequacy uh, uh, assessments for our banking system so that they, they, they're the highest quality assets of course and they, uh, they're they part of the regulative structure but that's got nothing to do with government spending. So uh, we have to finish in a minute Bill, Bill but um, uh, so I think we've seemed to have arrived at the nub of the matter which is that um, uh, the problem with MMT then is po possibly the fact that we don't trust politicians because without the constraint of debt and the sort of the debt limitation, whatever it might be, and the, the need to issue bonds, uh, we, we we think that politicians will just spend their heads off and not worry about anything, and that'll be terrible. There'll be no there'll be no discipline upon them. Yeah, no, I mean, and isn't that a sad statement of the quality of our political class? Yeah, but uh, it's I but, it, that... but it's politicians have been like that since since the Roman Empire. Let's face it. And and will always yeah. be like that. Yeah. So do we do we really want to have do do we really want to have a system where we uh, uh, we lie to the people, uh, which is effectively what what you're saying. And 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 and, and an economist, uh, Paul Samuelson, one the famous American economist, once said, if everybody worked out the the way the actual system. That is that this debt isn't necessary, etc. If everybody worked that out, they'd be demanding willy nilly off their governments, and that's probably true. That's and, right. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I accept that. That's that's probably true. But is is that really? Do we really want to operate in a smokescreen of ignorance? And 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 and, and from my point of view, that smokescreen of ignorance allows politicians to make really poor political choices. And uh, you know, to me, the the to me, unemployment is a you know is a scourge, and uh, it's we allow gov governments to maintain high levels of unnecessary unemployment and, and despair because they we we're in this you know smog of ignorance. I think uh, I'm more of optimistic about human human capacity and. Uh, I'd just like to think that we should have these things out in the open and we we aim for a better political class. But, you know, you can call me naive if you think uh, 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 about that, but that's my view. I don't think, as an academic, I don't think we should be uh, having this smokescreen of ignorance about the way the government operates. We, we should have a much more informed political debate on and, and based upon what really is the situation and then fight it out that way. But I accept your point. We don't trust the politicians, and so we have these uh, constraints on them. Well, that's probably a good note on which to end, Bill. It's been fantastic talking to you. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome, Alan. Thanks for inviting me. Take care. That was Bill Mitchell, Professor of Economics at the University of Newcastle.